I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Rhonda Heights, and I am a parent resource coordinator at MMI. And um, just want to kind of talk a little bit about um, what we are going to visit with um, of, regarding this evening. Um, can someone just kind of nod their head? Can you see my slides? Okay, perfect. Um, so the Transition Education Series um, is really an opportunity um, for families to get information about all the things that kind of go into transition and because there's a lot of things that happen during this time. And so tonight we are going to be um, discussing, um, like I said, medical transition and adult wellness. Um, but first, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we are recording these sessions. Um, all of those sessions uh, we are working on <laughs> getting the format kind of worked out uh, where they will be housed on our website so people can go back and review those videos. And um, if they haven't, weren't able to catch them the first time, that they can go back and look at those. Once that's been um, up and running, I will go ahead and send an announcement out to everybody who's on the mailing list. So um, if you, since you've registered, I have all of your contact information. So that's what I will use to go ahead and let you know when those are available. Um, due to the fact that this is statewide, and we are have lots of people that are gonna be joining us. Um, we will be going ahead and disabling the microphones and the videos. Um, otherwise, it's really difficult to kind of monitor and so we're not talking over each other as well. So if you have questions, um, please send them via the chat uh, to Jennifer Hansen. There's a couple of us that are co-hosts, um, but Jennifer is gonna be the one that's moder um, moderating those questions. So if you could send them to her, that would be great. And then um, when we get to kind of some different pausing points, she will go ahead and ask those questions just to kind of make it flow better. So, some of you who are in the Omaha area may understand, no, <laughs> we are experiencing some severe weather this evening or we plan to. So we do have some contingencies in plan um, uh, so that if something happens and one of us is not able, we'll try to get hooked back up um, to get that and another person will take over the slides and we can call in what have you. So just bear with us if we do have technical difficulties, everybody stay safe. Um, like I said, um, don't worry about missing information. If you <laughs> need to take shelter, um, we will have this available for you um, at, at another time as well. Also, at the end of the evening, we do have a quick poll that I'll put up on the screen to have, um, basically just to get feedback from you, the families, um, so we know how good of a job we're doing. Are, are there topics that we're not hitting? Is this been helpful? What could we do to make this the most beneficial for families? Um, it's really important to us to know that we're hitting the mark and if we can do something better, we want to do it better. So um, just a little information. I have a flyer that I've recently um, put together with, you know, kind of about the healthcare transition clinic. Um, but has information on there as far as like how to go ahead and set up an appointment if you're interested. So you have that in your slides that I sent you this afternoon if you registered before noon. Um, so take a look at that and um, lots of good information there as well. So tonight we are really fortunate to have both Dr. Smith and Parker um, who are part of Nebraska, Nebraska Medicine. Um, and our internal medicine and in pediatrics. So they're going to kind of go through um, what looking for those um, healthcare providers when you're transitioning from pediatrics to adulthood and how to um, kind of work through that, um, that transition. We also have um, Annie Woodruff Jameson and Sam Montemanaro um, to discuss adult wellness and how that how OTPT and discussing sexual health can all be things that they can help with and assist with um, into adulthood. And there's just my contact information. If you have any questions or anything afterwards or would like more information about this or another topic, please feel free to go ahead and give me a call, shoot me an email, and I will get back to you and we can um, set up a time to meet or discuss. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let Dr. Smith take over. Oh, and I think you might be muted. Hold on. Unmuted. There you go, okay. Okay. 
Um, so I am Sarah Smith. I'm one of the MedPeds physicians at UNMC, and along with Dr. Parker, Dr. Jennifer Parker, we're going to go through some of the issues with medical transition um, for for our age group here. So, Dr. Parker, I'll let you start. Um. So I, I just wanted to start with a few cases. I um, began doing uh, MedPeds at UNMC back in about 2003. Um, at that time, there were no other MedPeds providers. Um, and it, uh, we were, um, I guess our, our pediatric partners quickly realized that we were um, sort of a natural fit to help transition some of their patients as they uh, progressed into adulthood. Um, and so I sort of began unofficially, or sort of, I guess, um, uh, maybe just um, unorganizedly uh, um, transitioning patients um, uh, who would just be referred to me at various ages by various providers whom I knew um, um, from working here. Uh, and I started to realize that some of these transitions seemed to go really well and um, easily, and the patients tended to do a lot better um, post-transition, and some did not. Um, and as I was thinking through what we needed to do to um, make the transition more seamless, um, I, Dr. Smith joined me, and she had a strong interest in this, um, and as there has been more interest nationwide as, as well. And so she's really taken this on um, <clears throat> excuse me, to help us kind of develop a formalized program to help patients. So what I was seeing way back when um, is uh, sometimes I would get patients actually way before we consider sort of the, the um, age at transition, which is typically between that sort of pediatric to adult age. So here in Nebraska, as you all know, that's like turning 18 to 19. Um, but I would sometimes have patients that were a little bit earlier um, um, come to me. And I um, had these two patients, um, both about the same age, one was 15 and one was 16. Um, the 15 year old had congenital heart disease. It was a very complicated medical case. Um, and he had been in the uh, pediatric ICU at Children's uh, and the hospitalist there um, said, hey, I, I think he needs um, a sort of a, a med peds minded person to help manage him at this, at this age a little earlier than we normally have we're transitioning patients um, and was able to um, get him uh, set up in our clinic and I was able to meet with the family and uh, over several visits I met with them multiple times in those first couple of years um, to try to establish um, trust and rapport and get a bunch of his um, not only his sort of acute medical and heart related issues but things like pain control and other things um, uh, a little bit better managed and Ultimately, we were able to manage him until his death, and that went it went well. It was a lot of work on everyone's part, but I think that was one of the, our better transitions. At the same time, I had um, a 16-year-old girl with sickle cell disease who uh, had obviously a complicated medical course, but not nearly the sort of same amount of medical, um, at least medications, etc. Um, and I we had a lot of barriers to connecting with her. Uh, it seemed every time she would come in, we would plan for something at your next visit, we're going to do this. And then um, maybe she would miss her next visit. And the next time she came in, she would come in for maybe a sinus infection or something and we'd forget to talk about things. And ultimately um, there were a couple of visits where we said, we really need to talk about some form of birth control. She said, I want to think about it. I want to talk to my mom about it. I need to talk to my hematologist about it. And ultimately she ended up um, getting uh, pregnant and unexpected pregnancy. Um, which ended up with a septic abortion, uh, and and she's had some issues with depression since that time, and um, that that to me was a um, just a, a, a maybe as much my fault as anyone's, but just a, not a great transition. We're still working on it, but those two patients that were the same age really had a different experience. Um, oh, Sarah, are you ready? Yep. Um, so we sometimes get patients ready to transition older, which can be a little harder because there's sort of this time crunch, like it seems that they need everything at once and Sarah will go over this in more detail. Um, but I had a, a partner um, walk past me in the hall at the hospital and say, hey, I have a patient, he needs to see you now. Our nurses in clinic won't see him anymore, he's 22. Oh, by the way, we put him in the hospital, usually in the ICU for his constipation. So can you? Can you get this arranged, which I, I'd never met the patient, and the adult ICU won't really do those kinds of things. And so 
um, that required uh, a lot of um, work and planning and um, we had to sort of alter the, 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 the long-term plan for this patient's management uh, and it, it was a, a rough, um, I would say several months until we got him um, kind of on a path that he could easily sort of continue as an adult. Um, and then again, in contrast, um, I had a 19 year old who would be at the age of transition. They were very close to their pediatric provider who was a really good physician. Um, and he had started talking to them about transitioning. His grandmother is actually the one that manages him. And she was very nervous about it and wasn't sure if she could trust a new team. So she um, came up to visit us prior, like a year before they were ready to transition just to meet us, to meet the nurses, to hear about how the clinic would work and make sure that she could sit with it for a while and feel comfortable transitioning to us. And then when it happened, it was a very fluid transition because we knew all of his medical plans. So that was great. Um, so probably the best transition um, uh, experience I had was I had a 20 year old female just sort of on my schedule as any other patient. I wouldn't have known that there was anything wrong necessarily who came in um, with her mother and actually a home health nurse who had been with her for several years. Uh, and she had a um, pediatric PCP who had been her doctor for most of her life. Um, and towards the end of her um, late teens, they had transitioned her, or they had uh, began working with the hand in hand program at Children's um, to develop sort of long-term goals and planning. And she had an active DNR, DNI order on her chart her mom had a very good plan for, this is how much more support I want to give. Um, she, she said, we'll be able to go up on the ventilator support. Um, and certainly I'd put her in the I hospital and give her IV fluids or whatever, but I don't want to do any code. And I don't, I don't want to, she had a whole list of things that she didn't want to do. She also had a whole bunch of uh, medicines that she could use um, sort of more emergently to try to keep her at home for things like seizures or pain. Um, and we were able to work through in that, in that very first visit how she could get refills on those if needed or after hours. So that was a really, really great transition, which I really attribute to the hard work done by this team prior to me assuming uh, care of her. So I, I looked at this and as Sarah and I started talking about how to develop um, a program um, uh, for patients here, uh, we realized that this is sort of the, the things that we need in place. And then Sarah has taken the ball and run with it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, sorry, I got distracted. My kids are uh, running around. If it sounds like elephants, it's my children running around on the floor above me. Anyway, um, so we are here to talk about transitions. And uh, like Dr. Parker said, we're specifically addressing the medical side of things as the, as the um, physicians here. But of course, Transition is very comprehensive, and there's much more to it than just the medical piece. Um, from a medical perspective, we define transition as purposeful and planned movement of adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and medical conditions from a child-centered to adult-oriented healthcare system. So I like to emphasize that purposeful and planned part because um, the, the instances where we don't have as much planning or, or purpose sometimes don't go as well. Our goals are to ensure continuity of care for the patient as they, as they go between pediatric to adult healthcare providers. We also want to health improve, help improve health literacy and also self-empowerment of the patient so that they can be their, their best uh, manager of themselves. And we know that every young adult, every adolescent should get some transition planning, but those with special healthcare needs are especially, it's especially necessary. The numbers of youth with uh, chronic conditions are very high in our country. There are at least 30 million youth between the ages of 18 to 24 in the United States and 30% of them have one or more chronic condition and 5% of those have a, a disability that affects daily functioning. So those are some pretty high numbers. And studies have shown that around 60% of youth or the majority of those with special health care needs do not receive the necessary preparation to transition from pediatric to adult care. So a lot of times transition planning just isn't happening. And we'll talk about why that may be. And you might, you know, why, why are we kind of harping on transition? Why do we think it's so important? Well, if we don't have a good transition, we can end up with young adults and 
older adults who have an unnecessary dependence on their parents or guardians, um, developmental difficulties, psychosocial delays. There can be a lack of continuity of care, which can lead to increased morbidity and mortality, other medical problems. If we don't have a good transition, patients might not be as engaged with healthcare services. And with lapses of care and, and so forth, there might be increased costs as well. This is a slide, uh, a table that I have taken from gottransition.org, which is a site where um, I get a lot of my, my resources and guidelines. And so you'll have this, and I think, it's, I think it's a nice chart to review, and I give it to the patients that we see in our transition clinic to help highlight some of the differences between pediatric care and adult care. And there are a few I'll touch on just this evening. One is when, you, when you're used to seeing your pediatrician or your family care doctor or your med peds doctor as a child, um, and you know them and you've been seeing them for so much time, for your whole life, and they know all your medical conditions, you feel very familiar and comfortable. And seeing a new doctor on the adult side can be stressful. So I try to prepare young adults and their families to know that it might be a different scenario. There might not be as much as many uh, as much handholding or as many friendly smiles. Um, time is often an issue. So I try to prepare people for that. Adult practices also, unless a young adult has a guardian or otherwise uh, um, legally appointed reason, they expect young adults to schedule their own appointments or and let them know if they can't attend the visit and get their own prescriptions. So there's much more responsibility put on the patient as opposed to the family. And finally, I, a lot of adult specialists don't provide any sort of primary care, which I've seen in some of our pediatric subspecialists, they will kind of, especially if they're really, you know, it's the main problem for the patient, they kind of just take over and help with that primary care piece. But the adult specialists pretty much stay in their lane. So you really need that primary care doctor to help coordinate everything. And this is a, another chart, which I think is really interesting and lays out some of those differences. Again, the length of appointment, adult appointments, sometimes we're pressured to see pretty complicated patients in a short period of time. So it's, it's best to be prepared for that. And again, the patient role as a self-advocate is really considered important in adult care. I think in, as an adult provider myself, I know there are situations developmentally where my adult patients can't or are unable to, to have that self-advocacy role. So um, we always take that into consideration, but they, there's some culture differences between the two practices. And again, in, a, in adult care, a lot of physicians, providers also really put the onus on the patient to follow up on treatment. And if, if the patient doesn't follow up, doesn't take their medications, we, it's considered, you know, that's their, that's their problem, more or less. They kind of made that decision. Um, I think in pediatrics, we tend to follow up a little more and make sure things are patients are adhering to treatments, or how can we help accommodate patients to adhere to treatments? There's not as much of that in the adult side for the, for the most part. So why are we not doing the best at transitioning patients from pediatrics to adult medicine? And the, the barriers lie on both sides. One, on pediatrics, we tend to start the process a little bit too late. It's suddenly our patient's 18, 19, 20, and we just, we can't see them in our clinic anymore. So we're saying, you've got to get out and go to the adult provider. We can't see you anymore. And at that point, there's little time to prepare that patient for the transition to adult medicine. Um, so beginning it too late, there's also not as much as we don't like to think about the, you know, healthcare being a money-making industry. They're it unfortunately is that way, and there just really isn't that much reimbursement for these for this planning, um, and not always a lot of transition planning training either on both sides. 
time is always an issue. Time is always an issue for everything, it feels like. Um, we also know that a lot of patients and their families don't want to leave their familiar doctor because they're so comfortable and they've been so close and they've been taken care of so well that it's, it's nerve wracking to have to transition to an adult doctor. So that's, that can be a barrier on both ends. On the adult side, there is a, there's a problem with um, not enough training and and preparation for our providers to manage some of these chronic conditions of uh, childhood. And hopefully with time, some of the training gets better, especially as we're seeing more and more patients age and, and live longer, more fulfilling lives. So, um, but that is a barrier at this time. And then we all have issues facing the end of life issues with youth if, if it is a chronic terminal condition and Unfortunately, there are not, not enough social work or care coordinators in the world, just in general. And I put this picture of a handshake because the transition shouldn't be, it should be a warm handshake. There should be communication from the pediatric provider to the adult provider, um, this primary care to new primary care, subspecialist to new subspecialist. There should be that warm handshake as opposed to uh, no communication at all and just kind of an abyss. I'm going to touch on something now that we, when we have our clinic at, for the transition clinic at Monroe Meyer, we uh, include something called transition readiness and preparation. And this is a questionnaire, which I'll show you an example of to assess where a patient and the family is in the process of transition readiness and to help us identify what areas need work. And then we use that information to set goals. And we are aware that some areas will always need help and we, it, that the patient might not be able to do, it, do this task themselves. So in that situation, we help develop a plan, whether it will be a guardian, whatnot. So um, this is actually, so this is the questionnaire that is on our Monroe Meyer transition website. So I have a link to that website at the end of this. I think you're gonna get a flyer for it, but these are the questions that we, include on this. So for the patient, some examples are if I know my medical needs and then the patient can say, yes, I know this or I need to learn or someone needs to do this. Um, I can explain my medical needs to others. Another one, I know my allergies and medicines and so forth. So patients just go through that if you are attending our clinic, you fill this out online, it gets sent to us, we review it before you even come in. This is the parent version of that. So this is from the parent perspective filling out. We have a Spanish version of this online too. So in addition to that, another- Kristen. Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that the, the, those are available on our website. Yes. If anybody wants to take a look at those, mm -hmm. um, that that's something that you can just go in and by going to the transition healthcare clinic, um, that you can actually see and, and look at those um, as well, just to kind of get an idea of what they look like. So. Yeah, if nothing else, I think they also are kind of a nice worksheet that you can go through to see some of the things that we, we'd like our patients to be able to, um, to manage, or at least consider management, or if a patient can't manage it, manage it who will. Another resource we have on the website is something called My Health Passport. This is another, it's, it's several pages long, but it, it includes medical history, so medical conditions, medications, um, but things I like on it that it also includes are areas where a patient can say how they look when they're feeling well and not so good. Uh, because if a patient is, for example, nonverbal or, or has a different way of communicating, it might be good to have that written down. So should they ever show up to the ER where someone's not familiar with them or to another office, that information is there. Um, and this is something we have scanned into the chart too after a patient fills it out. So this is more of the information on that health passport. Basically a medical history plus some more, it, it outlines more of how a patient is at their baseline since we know that, that every patient is different. 
I want to touch on how important a primary care doctor is. I think it's it's really important to identify a new primary care doctor to help coordinate things going forward too. So that's part of what we also do at the transition clinic is help identify a good fit primary care doctor and communicate with that person. And that doctor, that person can help guide specialist needs and referrals going forward. Um, I, like I said, we try to identify people that will be a good fit. And most of the time that means people are more flexible. They might be med peds providers or have more experience caring for chronic conditions and more comfortable in modifying office procedures for patients or modifying their physical exam approach and using adaptive communication strategies and also engaging the family and caregiver more than putting the all the focus on the on the patient alone when they might be operating within a family and caregiver unit. And then we also of course need to consider our condition-based transition. So if a patient has specialists or subspecialists, we examine who they should see as adults. Some specialists might not be needed in adulthood. For example, uh, as a child, uh, a patient might see a GI doctor for GERD or for reflux, whereas that might not be necessary as an adult. And many internists or family medicine doctors can manage can manage that um, competently. Similarly, endocrinology for hypothyroidism. Um, I have a lot of young adults who have trisomy 21 and as such have hypothyroidism and might've been seeing an endocrinologist as a child. Well, I, I, am, I feel quite comfortable managing hypothyroidism as an internist, so I can take that, take that over. So it's kind of nice because I think we can actually pare down some of the specialists that someone might be seeing, which might make it a little bit, little bit easier. Um, but we do use pediatric specialists to help get recommendations for adult referrals too. And sadly, though, the one, I, there are multidisciplinary models of complex care in the pediatric world, um, and those just don't really exist in the adult world, at least not now. But we do have, we have medical homes which offer things like social work, pharmacy assistance, um, behavioral health, psychological assistance, and all sorts of other resources, but we don't have that, that multidisciplinary model that, that we see in some of the pediatric complex clinics. I'm just going to go through these next few slides kind of quickly because they're very systems specific. So um, they don't apply to everyone, but I wanted to highlight a few things that I think are, are important to consider at the transition age. So in terms of respiratory needs, if a patient's on home mechanical ventilation or may have a tracheostomy, um, there are a lot of supplies and tools and, and training that comes along with that. And it's important to have an emergency action plan in place should anything go awry and know who you are going to contact um, should, should you need something. I feel, so this will come up with the nutrition too, but there are sometimes in this age group, as insurance coverage is changing, um, your pediatric provider might suddenly not be able to order supplies for you anymore. So if you're not already prepared for that and set up with an adult provider who can order those supplies for you, you can get caught in kind of a, a bad place. Um, nutritional needs, these are just because someone's no longer growing, it doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to pay attention to weight and, and growth. Malnutrition is common in patients with chronic conditions, whether it's because they have increased metabolic needs or poor intake or GI issues otherwise. And overweight and obesity are also really common as they are in our general population. So we need to continue, or continue to highlight that into young adulthood and beyond. Um, I'll, if, if I have a person on, or a patient on tube feeds or anything like that, I will often, I will always actually refer to get a dietary or nutritionist input, um, especially if it's been a while, because as that linear growth of childhood has stopped, I want to make sure we've got a good, um, we've got a good 
feeding regimen for a young adult because things change. Um, and then I, this coverage, again, I had this happen just a month or two ago and things were also complicated by this pandemic, but the pediatric, the pediatrician could no longer order this patient's tube feeds because she had turned 19 or 20, she's now receiving some Medicare, so he wasn't authorized to order it. So, um, and I, we were not seeing, we were not seeing new patients in clinic at that time because of the pandemic, nor did we want to bring in someone who was more susceptible to complications from COVID-19. So, um, thankfully, the, I was able to communicate with the pediatrician and we, I went ahead and ordered the <laughs> feeds without having met the patient and it's all fine, but it was, I'm sure that was a really scary place for the for the family to be to potentially not have any nutrition for for their child, um, and then it's also I I think it's important for everybody to know this that vitamin and minerals should be monitored anyway because if you take too much it's there is too much of a good thing and you can get toxic. Uh, bone health is really important, especially in a patient who's in a wheelchair or not weight bearing. So. The, we address calcium, which the recommended dietary allowance actually goes down once a person becomes a young adult. We make sure vitamin D is okay. And then um, we monitor for osteoporosis and osteopenia more common or more often and at a younger age. And I'll often work in conjunction with our endocrinologists, endocrinologists and getting uh, DEXAs or bone scans. Um, nutritionally also, I always address what type of tube my patient has, how often they need to replace it, how they replace it, and that make sure that they have what they need at home in case tube falls out, or what do you do with that? And it, the families always know <laughs> all this. Um, I just like to have it all on, on my record so we can be prepared if anything happens, but families are the best resource. Uh, I'll touch on the central nervous system real quick. Um, if some patients on intrathecal baclofen therapy, which um, I don't manage those bombs. We work with neurosurgery, but it's it, it can be a, a real medical emergency if it stops working all of a sudden. So we need to have a plan for that. Shunts are, are fairly common. So uh, anytime there's a behavior change or, or a fever or headache, we always consider shunt malfunction. Um, and vagal nerve stimulators are another device. Mobility impairment, I think, I, so when, when I see a patient, I've been my colleagues at physical therapy, occupational therapy at Mineral Meyer, um, I think it was Brad Kaur there, who I don't think, my internet connection is unstable, can you hear me? Okay. Um, he told me that more and more they're recommending that we just kind of get a baseline for mobility and a physical therapy assessment as opposed to waiting until we need a new wheelchair or waiting until there's an issue or pain. So um, I think that this is, I've been referring patients more and more and I've had some good outcomes. So I think getting that kind of baseline physical therapy evaluation, especially if it's been a while, can be really helpful to help. Um, our lights kind of flickered. Uh, um, improve mobility and adaptive functioning. And I know our next speakers are gonna talk about sexual and reproductive health, which is a very important topic and something I don't think we address enough. Uh, one topic on my end is menstruation and management. Periods can be uncomfortable and uh, and, and sometimes we will use hormonal, hormonal contraception methods to help abate those or make them more manageable. I think it's also, it's always important to remember that unfortunately, this, uh, the patient population with developmental disability, intellectual disability does suffer from increased rates of sexual victimization. So I, it can be hard to tease that out, but I, I try to bring that up and ask if, do you feel safe everywhere? Has anyone touched you? You don't want to be, but it, that's a really important topic and something to be aware of. And something else I think we don't always do so well is just discuss routine sexual health because 
there it's human nature to have a sex life so it's not it we shouldn't just overlook or skip over talking about safe sex practices um, with all of our patients and then on top of all this it's also really important to remember that general screening or healthcare maintenance that we recommend for all young adults all older adults still goes for for all of our patients with chronic conditions so these are listed here these are just some examples but all these go so things like a pap for example um and this is i actually talked with annie woodruff one of our next presenters about coordinating paps for patients with cerebral palsy or increased tone and um, how we can prepare our patients for that so there are a lot of ways we can help our patients work through that and we also talk about just goals of care with family and if a pap is something we think is is uh, necessary or not in my opinion it is necessary for healthcare screening so um, yeah we still do all the regular stuff too and then address dental care and ophthalmologic care audiology uh, there are certain conditions certain chronic conditions where I am referring patients to get hearing screens every periodically so that was a lot, um, but the good thing is we do have a transition clinic that is here for you. There is a team of people, a physician, a social worker, a parent resource coordinator, all at the visit. And then we have many, many more people, more resources that are available. We are able to address some of these medical needs, including helping to identify that very important primary care provider we address transition readiness and help set some goals. We go through the healthcare passport we talked about. And uh, there are so many other issues, insurance, excuse me, insurance, guardianship, vocation, education, more, more, more. We, we do it all. We try to do it all. So I included this little picture. There's this kind of sketchy looking bridge right there that you wouldn't want to walk on. Um, we don't want transition. We don't want you walking from the pediatric side of things to the adult side of things and having to cross this scary bridge like this. We want you to be on this big supported bridge um, where you feel safe and secure, where the patient can make the journey across, but has all this support from us, from their family, from their caregivers, from other resources. And a few takeaways, start thinking about it early early, early. Um, don't wait till age 18 or 19 when there's not much time to plan. Start bringing it up with when uh, patients 14 years old or even younger, engaging patients in taking their medicines and knowing what their medicines are for and talking to the doctor themselves. There's so much you can do starting at a young age. And you can use the transition readiness assessments to guide you. You can ask your pediatrician for guidance. Um, but come see us at the Monroe Meyer Transition Clinic. We start seeing patients as young as 14 and we'll help be that bridge to get you to get you to where you need to be. I have a few of my resources here. There's gottransition.org, just a national um, federal organization, ton of resources. There's our Monroe Meyer Transition Clinic and then another nice resource um, from uh, healthytransitionsnewyork.org. So that's what I got. I'll stop share. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, we just wanted to put it out there. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Smith or Dr. Parker? I don't know that we've received any yet in the in the chat, but um, now is your chance. Um, so what we could do, um, if we don't have any, we can go ahead and move on to, um, Annie and Sam's presentation. And, um, if, so if you think of any other additional questions, we can kind of round back to that, um, at, at the end of the session. Okay. All right. I will share my screen. How do I get you people out of the way now? There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so we are going to talk about 
uh, wellness for adults um, and kids going from that, going through that transition, um, and specifically how it rates relates to occupational therapy, physical therapy, and sexual health. And I should say, I'm Annie Woodruff-Jameson. I'm a physical therapist. And I'm Sam Montemorano, and I'm an occupational therapist. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to touch on that kind of relates to both physical and occupational therapy is the model that we are really moving towards, and this goes for pediatrics and for adults, um, is an episode of care. Um, an episode of care rather than um, treating someone their whole life, basically. So if you've grown up with a child with a developmental disability, it is likely that um, throughout their childhood, you may have seen OT and PT just forever. <laughs> um, and while there is stuff that we could all always work on, um, that is no longer really seen as the most effective model. Um, when you have goals that you specifically want to work on, things that um, either you see your child struggling with participation at home or at school, or they wanna get involved in something extracurricularly, um, that is when you would say like, okay, I think, um, I think we're ready for another episode of care. We're seeing these, um, these deficits or these new opportunities that we want them to be able to participate in. Um, and then you would come and do it, an evaluation with OT and P or PT um, specifically to address those goals. We know from research that the greatest gains come in about the first six weeks of treatment. Um, and we just don't want kids or adults to be in therapy forever because um, there's more, I don't wanna say important, but there's more important stuff um, for them to be participating in in the community. Um, so, uh, and like Dr. Smith mentioned, we, we would really like to see people um, to get a baseline. And this is especially important when we're talking about transition in adults. Um, it's important for everyone, but it's especially important for people who have um, the possibility of um, having progressive um, losses. So if you have an adult with Down syndrome or a, an adolescent with Down syndrome and we know that they're at higher risk of developing dementia, um, physical, physical traits can be one of the first signs that some of those declines are happening. So if we have a baseline for um, their physical activity and their balance, um, that's one way that we can detect that maybe they're going to need some um, extra assistance coming up or maybe that they, they need to go get checked out. Um, same with kids or kids and adults that experience seizures, um, that sometimes it's hard to tell um, if they have a big seizure or big event um, and you think maybe they've lost some function. If we have a baseline, we can say like, yeah, um, you're not quite as steady as you used to be or your endurance isn't quite as good as it used to be. Um, we know where, where you were at before and we know what you're capable of, so like let's get you up to speed. Um, so overall kind of moving towards more of like a, a dental model where you come in twice a year or once a year. I only go to the dentist once a year. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to do more, but um, regular, on a regular basis and um, get a baseline and address any problems that might be present. Do you have anything to add to that, Sam? Or do you want to? Nope, I think you covered that. Um, do you want to the next part next? Yeah. Um, so then below that is just some ways that occupational therapy can provide um, services and support in that adolescent and transition age into adulthood. Because a lot of people think um, their kids got OT in school and then once school's over, OT's done. We've done everything we can. Um, but that's actually not the case at all. A lot of, especially in the transition age, um, a lot of these children and adolescents are looking to go to live on their own or as they were stating earlier, you know, not relying on their parents as much for these independent living skills. Um, so these are some areas with really important independent living skills that we can support in um, money management. So nowadays, not really balancing a checkbook anymore, but more looking at how to open a checking account and a debit account and learning how to use a debit card. Um, but, budgeting money, things like that, paying bills um, if they want to get an apartment with a friend or anything like that. 
uh, personal hygiene, and we'll talk more about this later when we're talking about sexual health, but um, just really understanding, you know, as you get older, pu going through puberty and how you have to shower more and you have to wear deodorant um, and all those different kinds of skills. Home management, keeping things safe, um, learning how to lock doors appropriately, making sure um, being able to problem solve things in the kitchen and understanding um, not only with home management, but food prep, how to make items, how to use a stove versus a microwave versus an oven, safety along with those things. Um, community accessibility, if um, individuals are not driving or they don't have transportation, understanding where we can get transportation, how to use Uber, how to use Lyft. Um, if they're going to take the public bus, where are the bus stops? What are the routes they need? Um, those are all things. And then managing healthcare, um, being present, and this was kind of talked about earlier too, like with that survey that they give out, knowing who is your doctor, um, if you have more than one doctor, who are your specialists and helping make those appointments or helping have them on speed dial on your phone um, for kids who have wheelchairs and things like that, being able to be present and advocate for themselves if something's wrong with their wheelchair or anything like that. Um, so these are just like a wide variety of ways that occupational therapy can help in adolescent through adulthood. Um, and I think just a lot of people don't understand or they, it's not that they don't understand, it's not known widely that this is totally something that can go on through adulthood and we can provide services and support and as Annie mentioned um, using that episodic care so understanding okay so hey we're seeing you today and right now your goal is you want to be able to cook cook these meals independently in your home and so we spend six to eight weeks you know um, learning safety in the kitchen learning meal prep learning grocery shopping and then after the six to eight weeks um, giving them the tools and if they feel like they're ready and go on and Practice it out in the real world and we'll check in in a while. Um, we found that's the most successful right now. And so, yeah, that's all I have got. All right. So then for physical therapy, um, these are kind of things we've been focusing on specifically at Monroe Meyer. There are other adult providers throughout the community, but things that we have seen a need for and have been successful with implementing are um, community-based fitness programs. So figuring out, um, so typically how we run these is they come into Monroe Meyer for an evaluation and we get that baseline, that physical activity baseline, um, and we talk about goals, um, we talk about where in the community you are able to work out, um, what it looks like for you, how often you think it's, it's reasonable, and then um, you come in a few more times and we just start trying some stuff. And the ultimate goal is to either to discharge you um, to like a home gym, an apartment gym, a community gym, um, just somewhere, even if it's just like a walking program around your neighborhood. Um, we gradually, so we will start uh, like honing these skills at Monroe Meyer, and then we'll eventually transition you out into the community. And we've had a few successful handoffs, um, like Dr. Smith, Smith mentioned, uh, Brad Kaur and I do most of these. So he has worked pretty closely with um, with the CrossFit program out of uh, QLI and a couple gyms. He's had um, some handoffs with personal trainers. So once we have an idea of what people are capable of safely and um, what like a safe progression would be for them and then we're able to work with the people at these community-based programs we can kind of have that smooth handoff um, and feel comfortable that people are going to be safe but also challenged appropriately out in the community um, and then other people just want a home exercise program to do on their own um, at an apartment gym or at home and we we um, hand off to them as well so then Typically, we'll see these people again, like I said, every six months or every year to make sure that everything is going smoothly and to progress them as appropriate. Um, Work-based fitness and training is another area of need we've seen. So this is more for people who are going to be in a position where they want to look for competitive wage employment. And the idea is to kind of open the, the number of options available to them. So if you have someone who's maybe like a little out of shape or just doesn't have a lot of experience um, in physical activity, so some 
some competitive wage jobs can be really physical. You have to be on your feet for eight hours a day. You're going to do a lot of walking. Maybe you're um, shelving and you have, you have to pick up heavy boxes, carry and lifting. Um, it's just a lot of skills that if you don't do them well, um, you can get hurt. And if you don't ever do them at all, maybe people think like, well, they couldn't do that job um, because there's no way they could walk that long or there's no way they could um, lift that much or do that repetitive motion safely. Um, and those are skills that I think with some practice, most people can do pretty successfully or with some adaptations. Um, so just hoping that we can help people obtain competitive wage employment by being physically fit and um, knowing how to lift and do repetitive motions safely um, and then maintain that employment. And then um, kind of the, the more familiar things you think of with physical therapy, we continue to monitor equipment and orthotic evaluation and maintenance. Um, and like Dr. Smith kind of also mentioned, uh, it is nice to see people um, for like a baseline visit before you need new equipment or before you need no, new orthotics. Um, typically, you don't see someone until it's like super old or there's a problem and then we don't really know like what it looks like when things are good. Um, so it's hard to make a really good recommendation when you're just seeing things when they're bad. Um, so that's why it's nice to have a baseline for that. And then it, specific injury, um, if you need to rehab from that, that's very typical PT stuff. Um, are there any questions about kind of this more general OTPT stuff before we move on to the sexual health portion? I don't think that we've gotten any questions yet. All right, we will move on. Um, okay, so for sexual health, um, this is just another area of need we have seen um, throughout our various departments working. A lot of us have worked, um, a lot of us who have come together to create this program have worked in direct support for many years um, and have worked with clients who have expressed that um, it's, there's a lot of barriers to getting comprehensive sexual health care and education. Um, so we have kind of created a team here at Monroe Meyer to address some of um, those issues. So it's made up of OT, psychology, PT, um, recreational therapy, and then we also have a resource library. So we're just going to kind of do a brief overview of um, why this is important and the services that we have started to offer. This is just an important quote that we thought would be good to add about um, the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Children with Disabilities recently reaffirmed that to optimize development, young people with disabilities need access to support and education in all areas of sexuality, including puberty, pregnancy, pregnancy prevention, and social interaction. So just helping guide our practice and understanding how important this is. Um, so this community-based education portion is provided by Carly De Bruin in the Recreational Therapy Department, and she, I believe, is actually on the call tonight, but I won't <laughs> call her out and make her speak. Um, so Carly went through a um, intensive training called the Elevatus Training, which is um, a curriculum specifically for um, adolescents and adults with developmental disabilities, and it breaks down um, the foundations of knowledge that you need to um, even really talk about sexual health. So um, it starts with like pretty basic stuff about what is a private place and what is a public place. Um, things like that have a lot more nuance than you would expect. Um, for someone who takes, who takes things more concretely, um, there's a lot to talk about with issues like that. So it builds um, from very basic stuff like that all the way up to um, comprehensive self sexual education, um, discussing things like gender identity, um, reproduction, uh, consent, internet safety and social media, having children, pregnancy and STI prevention. So it's a, it's a very um, comprehensive curriculum and it's uh, very, val it was designed um, by and for 
people with disabilities. So um, it's very concrete and there's a lot of really good examples and it has been a really valuable tool so far. And then just some more stuff on why this is important. Um, a few quotes we found and things we thought of just to back up our practice. Uh, sex is happening regardless. Individuals with developmental disabilities have sexual encounters at a rate commensurate to their peers without disabilities. It reduces vulnerability to sexual abuse. Um, another quote, just individuals with developmental disabilities experience sexual assault and rape at a rate seven times higher than their peers without disabilities. So just understanding the education involved to be able to be a better reporter if something like that does happen. Uh, the lack of sexuality education in many schools, it's really hard to find. And if there is, um, nothing is really consistent. And um, a lot of the times, the curriculums that we have found, nothing has been adapted for people and students with disabilities. And so a lot of times they just opt out of it because the curriculum itself, the, the, the children, they're saying the students don't understand it. It's not at their level. Um, it helps combat unhealthy messages from the culture and media. Um, normalizing the topic. It's something we should be talking about just like every other topic we discuss every day. It's very important. It's something that's happening all across as we saw in the quotes above. Improves self-esteem and confidence. Gives parents and caregivers opportunities to express their opinions and values, which we think is really important that we always say we would never teach um, opinions or values. Every family is different. We're just giving the proper knowledge that we know helps individuals build the skills to develop and maintain healthy consenting relationships. There's a lot of discussion on all of these topics about consent and how that looks in many different ways and forms and um, increases equity in comprehensive preventative health services. Sorry, I think those slides got out of order. <laughs> um, okay, so this is me again. A lot of the stuff we talked about earlier in regards to independent living skills is very much applicable to the sexual health um, realm of things as well. They might just be a little more specified in um, particular. So home and bedroom management, you know, just proper etiquette um, and being able to maintain a bedroom if you want to have someone over um, and understanding that you want to have a clean house and a clean bedroom, um, having sheets done, um, you know, things you wouldn't want laying around or being seen. Uh, if it's someone you're meeting for the first time, understanding, you know, we wouldn't want your checkbook lying out or your bank statements. Um, money management, how to be able to take someone on a date, uh, the social things involved with that. How to be able to uh, purchase birth control if that's not something that's provided to you and understanding how to do all of those different things. Um, personal hygiene and health, this um, goes along with just wanting to smell good for yourself and be clean for yourself and a partner. Also, uh, understanding for anyone who has menstruation and feminine care products, how to use tampons and pads appropriately, um, how often to change them and things along those lines. Managing healthcare, uh, being active and present in gynecological exams, and Annie's going to talk more about that. Um, talking about picking out your doctors and who you feel comfortable with um, because you're going to be doing breast examinations and testicle examinations and things along those lines. So just making sure you feel comfortable with those um, and being able to think of questions to ask during those appointments, um, talking about birth control and what your options are, uh, all of those things. So being able to advocate for yourself within those healthcare appointments. And then adaptive equipment, if there are some physical barriers to, and you want to participate in sexual activities, uh, myself and uh, physical therapy can help support and find equipment to be able to make that happen for you. Um, we also have a psychologist on our team, and she is an adult provider at Monroe Minor. She has um, a long history of treating behavioral sexual health issues, both down at Beatrice and for the state through DHHS. Um, and she has some assessment tools that she can use to determine someone's current understanding of relationships and, and sex. Um, so that is really important because a lot of people, you might um, assume that either they don't know anything, um, they're like, oh, they're just oblivious, like, we don't have to worry about it because that's it's never going to be an issue for our family or for him. 
Um, and that might not actually be the case. They might have some understanding. Or on the flip side, you might have someone who um, has heard a lot of like slang or people talking or picked up stuff from TV shows and speaks as though they have a really strong understanding of um, of sexuality. And in reality, it's all surface level and they really don't know and they could really benefit from um, some comprehensive education. Um, and she's also, um, she also treats um, inappropriate displays of sexual behavior. Uh, so that is um, something that probably draws our attention to sexuality and people with disabilities more than anything, um, at least from my work in the schools. Uh, that seems to be the only time people really start to think about it is like, oh, wow, look what they're doing. This is so inappropriate. Um, so that might be at least a foot in the door um, and a sign that they, they would benefit from some treatment and some further education. So for physical therapy, um, I've been trained in pelvic floor rehabilitation. And so um, that is a specialty of physical therapy that is um, offered throughout Omaha to people of all um, ages and abilities. But I have uh, kind of wanted to practice specifically at Monroe Meyer with it um, because I have a long history of being a pediatric physical therapist and wanted to combine those two to um, special, especially offer a service for people um, with developmental disabilities. Um, so what that would can consist of um, is bowel and bladder incontinence is usually what I've had most of my referrals for. Um, and a lot of people who have disabilities might assume or their families might assume or some doctors might even assume that um, bowel and bladder incontinence is just part of part of what we're working with. Um, it's just part of your disability. It's part of who you are. Um, but there's actually quite a bit we can work on, um, even with people who have been diagnosed with like neurogenic bladders. Um, there's quite a bit we can do with your pelvic floor muscles, with um, analysis of your fluid and fiber intake uh, to address some of that stuff. And if not, if nothing else, um, if you can't really can't achieve true continence, some people can't, and that's fine. Um, we can at least work to achieve some social continence so that you don't have to worry about um, having bladder or bowel leaks when you're in public or um, just to make them more scheduled. So that's not as big of an issue. Um, that, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, um, bowel incontinence and actually a lot of bladder incontinence is actually really closely linked to constipation. Um, and a lot of people, especially people in um, wheelchairs who don't move as much, have chronic constipation issues. Um, so that is something that I help manage um, in close communication with a physician. Um, we can work on, um, on some muscle relaxation techniques, some toileting hygiene uh, to help try to relieve some of those issues um, while they on the physician side are working on like titrating Miralax or um, trying Senna or whatever they're, um, whatever they're trying at the time to work together to work through those issues. Um, some people want to, like Sam talked about, engage in sexual activity, but think they're limited because of a physical impairment. So um, as a part of our resource library, we have some tools that people can trial, um, not like a full-on trial, but just to see if they're like enough support for them, if it's something that they would want to purchase in their home um, or try out with their partner on their own. And we also, I can also address some pelvic pain. So pelvic pain usually comes up for women when you have your um, gyne your pelvic exam through your gynecologist. Um, either it'll be like excruciatingly painful or you won't even try it because you're so afraid that it's going to be excruciatingly painful. Um, you've never been able to use a tampon because you have pain um, or you want to try to use a tampon but you're scared. Um, there's some relaxation and some stretching that we can do in your pelvic floor. It's just like any other muscle group um, and some techniques that we can use to make those um, to make those experiences 
not, I mean, they're never really going to be totally pleasant, <laughs> but um, a lot less painful and hopefully reduce a lot of your anxiety around it. Um, they're like Dr. Smith kind of talked about briefly. Um, we can work on different positioning for you to um, have your pelvic examine. We can talk about um, if you need like another person in there to help support a leg or um, to help uh, calm you down. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, for people with spasticity specifically, um, a lot of times physicians will be like, okay, I know this is going to be unpleasant, so we're just going to do this as fast as possible. Um, get it over with and it'll be fine. But for someone with spasticity, that can actually be a really damaging approach. Um, we know that motion, um, and the faster the motion, the stronger your response is going to be. So the best approach is actually to use a warm speculum um, to go really slow, nice and easy, um, and to give them time to breathe through everything. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of education um, and some work that we can do to make those experiences a lot better. Um, we can manage pregnancy and postpartum care. And then um, with all of this just comes a lot of education. A lot of our sessions are just talking. Um, this is an area that a lot of people just don't know much about in general. So uh, like half of my visits are mostly just talking and having people, helping people understand um, how their body works and how they can advocate for themselves in all of these areas. Um, and this is actually, I'm gonna show you guys our website when we're talking about our resource library. Um, we have, like I said, all of these books and then some equipment. Um, this is a picture of uh, my physical therapy, my pelvic floor physical therapy room. Oops, sorry. I find my website. Okay. Um, so the easiest way to find this is just to search MMI sexual health services because our website is kind of um, all over the place. <laughs> and if you search MMI sexual health services, it should be the first thing that pops up and it'll get you here. Um, so it just has some information about all the services we offer, but um, on this tab, it says, what do you have in your resource library? And it just has a list of all of the books that we have with links to them. And then the equipment that we have to trial um, with links to them as well. So uh, right now we are not letting people check out these books because we only have one copy. <laughs> um, but you are welcome to come in anytime if you call uh, Barb up here. Yeah, the, at this top in the contact us section. Um, if you call or email her and say, I want to set up a time in the sexual health resource library, you and your family members are welcome to come browse through all these books and see if there's something that you think would be appropriate uh, for you to buy for home, or you can just read it there and have a conversation with your loved one at that time. Um, we also have some links to other local resources and some other online resources that are really useful, um, as well as all of our um, other information. So that is available now. And I believe, yes, I, that's it. Any other questions on that stuff? Everyone's waiting for storm. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking to see. I know Jennifer was having some issues um, with her internet, so I, I just want to make sure. Um, we didn't have any additional questions. Okay, okay. Um, we did have one come in for Dr. Um, Smith and Parker. Um, are there other meds peds physicians in the Omaha area? Sarah, do you want me to take that? <laughs> yeah, um, there, there actually are. I, we at, at Nebraska Medicine, we now have a cohort of, oh my gosh, Sarah, you're gonna have to help me. 
I think there's six of us now doing outpatient med peds um, uh, through, through just Nebraska Medicine. And we primary we are primarily located primarily located in North Omaha um, at our Fontenelle Clinic. But one of our newer providers is actually out in um, is she at Chalco, Sarah? Chalco, yes. Yeah, Chalco. So she's um, more west, and she has just moved to Nebraska Medicine. But she's a, a longtime practitioner um, and is very comfortable doing transition management. We really try to individualize who is the best PCP for um, a patient based on. Uh, Oftentimes it's actually location. So clearly if you don't live in Omaha, we try um, to find you a PCP kind of closer to home. And we oftentimes are, help, um, are happy to be more consultative. And I have a lot of patients that I manage from maybe like Sioux City or sometimes Lincoln. Um, but I like to have someone local in case there's an emergency and you need to see someone quickly or not an emergency, but something you need to see someone quickly for and you don't want to drive two hours for your sinus infection or something. So um, we, we kind of look at a lot, actually a, a good number of patients may have family medicine physicians that are really comfortable staying, um, at, staying on as their PCP, but they might need a little bit of guidance, both transitioning the subspecialty care and then a lot of other things that Sarah covered, such as making sure that we have um, uh, no lapse in insurance and that we get guardianship in place. And then all of the, um, certainly all of the uh, kind of um, functional, um, trying to maximize functionality. So, so we can provide consultation in those, um, in those instances as well. Part of us seeing patients is to just help prepare them. And sometimes the answer is you can actually stay with your P current PCP, but these are the things we'd like to achieve kind of as you reach um, young adulthood. Uh, other times they really do need to have a, tr a transition in, um, in care provider and there are some um, internal medicine or even family medicine providers that are pretty comfortable but just need um, a, a kind of a map or like a, a starting playbook to help them um, take over patients. And the reality, when I had first envisioned this, I thought, well, I'll just do this. I'll just transition all of these patients that have um, maybe um, kind of complex healthcare needs. Um, and then it as you saw from uh, Dr. Smith's slides and the numbers, it became very clear that there's just way too many, even for all the MedPeds people. So I don't know, Sarah, do you have any other thoughts? No, I, I agree. I, I think um, that's, I, I touched on how I think there needs to be, and there will be more education and preparation amongst like general internists and family medicine doctors. But even so, we're here to also serve as consultants in a way. So. When I do, when I've sent a patient from the transition clinic to a new primary care doctor, um, for example, if the patient has uh, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, I'll include some facts about Down syndrome in an adult, recommended screening guidelines for the lifespan, and then also, so that's all included in a transition package that I give to that new doctor. And then I also give them all my contact information and say, you know, we're here for you as a resource going forward if you have questions um, so that we can help guide you. And the other thing that I do as well, um, so not only lo location is actually a big factor, um, but I also, so there are um, uh, MedPeds physicians at other healthcare systems. Uh, there's some at the, in the CHI system and there's some um, at Methodist and there's I think even a, a private group where there has been historically. Um, I know a lot of those providers, but I try to base um, the system that would be best for the patient. Um, sometimes there's not an identified um, kind of main um, complex healthcare problem, but if there is, let's say they have um, complex congenital heart disease and they are going to be followed in our young adults with congenital heart disease clinic and be awaiting a heart transplant, um, those would be patients that I would say, well, let's try to keep you within the system where they're going to do your cardiac care because clearly the, um, the communication is easier in those instances. So we may base it off of where's your where's your main sort of specialty provider going to be? And then let's find a physician within that within that network. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes they, they say, oh, I could go anywhere for my, you know, sort of not as important or not as specialized um, subspecialty care. Um, and then we can say, well, let's, let's start with finding you the best PCP. And I also try to do, I think, I don't know, Sarah, if you touched on this, but I also try to um, time the transition um, 
uh, a little bit differently. So if, if we're ready to transition from a primary care standpoint, I'd like to sort of take that on earlier. And, and oftentimes the um, pediatric subspecialists will follow them for a little bit longer, maybe till they're 20 or 21, and then make those changes a little later so that everyone's not changed all at the same time, which is a lot harder for the patient at, patients and their families. Um, I, I, some, so it doesn't always work that nicely. So most, a lot of the specialties, um, especially I think about like pediatric endocrinology, um, they will do um, a, like uh, the pediatric endocrinology people like to take like their type one diabetic patients all the way up to like 24, 25. And our um, adult um, endocrinologists will start taking care of them sometimes as young as 15, 16, 17. So there's a really nice like wide range that you can transition those patients. Other specialties, sometimes the, the adult providers are not wanting to take them until they're um, really sort of well into adulthood and the pediatric providers aren't really covering them or if they get admitted to the hospital um, and the pediatric primary care people can't admit them. So they have to go to the adult team, but they only have a pediatric, you know, care uh, subspecialist. It gets a little bit hard, but we're, that's our job is to help navigate that. And we work, try to work with the families um, and their current care team to, to provide the best roadmap for that. We've had a couple questions come in here. Um, how does a sexual health clinic get billed? Yeah, so um, OT, PT, and psychology all can just bill through insurance. So um, just whatever your, your normal insurance plan covers um, all plans of care, regardless of uh, the nature of them. So that is not an issue. Um, we are still working on how to figure out the education portion of it. Um, they are not allowed to bill through insurance, so it would typically be self-pay. Um, but we have tried to apply for a few grants they're pending um, to try to make that more widespread and to kind of get the word out there and allow people to participate and hopefully um, see the value of it uh, before we uh, switch and start start doing it specifically self-pay. Okay and then another one um, regarding billing. Um, can group physical fitness sessions get billed under Medicaid or other insurance? Uh, so that gets tricky. Um, it depends on, so you have to have a current plan of care with the physical therapist and in order to make group therapy worthwhile for us, as selfish as that sounds, um, we have to usually have a couple people in the group, um, in order to like make it viable. Um, if you are, oh man, it will like really be case to case. It, the answer could be yes and it could be no, depending on your situation. So that might be a good like follow up with me afterwards and we can talk situation and Amanda, go ahead. Thank you. So I go to the CrossFit class that Annie had talked about. It is not built through insurance. They do charge $25 a session but they have scholarships if you're unable to pay. So there is some resources, ConAgra gave them a big grant. So that specific program does have, they do like a sliding scale fee or no cost. Okay, and then uh, um, is there anything you would suggest to families on how to prepare their daughter to have their first pelvic exam? Dr. Smith or Dr. Parker, do you want to, or do you want, I mean, I can I'm actually going to say refer to Annie. Prior. I know. I say, <laughs> I always, so when I do see a patient in clinic and we, I bring up the subject, um, I kind of, I tell them what it would be like to do it. I walk them through it more or less and kind of show them the speculum and all that and um, uh, just prepare them that way. But if I did have concerns or or needed more assistance, I would refer to Annie to, to help out. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, if, they, if they've had trouble in the past, like if they've never inserted a tampon or they have, but it's been really painful or something, I think that would definitely be a sign that you might wanna come see me before you do um, a pelvic exam. We can, we use vaginal dilators 
um, and progress from like one that's like a pinky sized all the way up to like a speculum, bigger than a speculum size really. And then I also have speculums in my office. So um, we can actually practice with it before they go into their appointment um, if that's something that we think that they need. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would, I also coach them a little bit about like, it's not, it's not going to be pleasant, like, but it's, you know, it's going to be over and you have control over, um, you're able to ask for these things and you can help control with your breathing and with like with some relaxation techniques that we try and we can practice. So we can definitely reduce a lot of anxiety around it, I think. And I'm sure most of you know, but the recommendations for screening pap smears have changed pretty drastically, even over my um, just lifespan as a physician. Um, so we used to start them very young, and now we don't, we, they're really not required for anyone until age 21. And if they're normal, we're doing them about every three years. So that's good and bad, I think. The good news is you can really tell the patient, like, it, it if we could get you in a comfortable place and we can get this done, we might not, we won't have to do this again for three years if everything is normal. Uh, but it's also bad because I think it's a, they don't, uh, patients then kind of don't, it, it's more anxiety provoking because they haven't gone through it as much, I guess, every time. I don't know, Dr. Smith, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I agree. I think it's, I liked Annie's point too, to set expectations. I tell every young woman, it's not fun. It, it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, but we'll get through it. And I always also tell them, you know, if it gets painful or you get really uncomfortable, I'll stop. Like we're, you're in control of the situation. Um, but yeah, the, the relaxed guidelines, I think help, but like you said, Jen, then it also like makes every pap smear another, they're so far apart. They're, you know, there's more apprehension and and more time to build up that. <laughs> yeah, and they, they always seem new again. Because imagine, like, you know, you, like, finally you're 21 and you do it and then you get to forget about it for all these years and then all of a sudden, oh, no, and I have to do that again. And, ah, um, I, I forgot what that was like, so. We did have another question come in about the pelvic exam. Um, is sedation ever used for the exam? I don't use sedation in my office, but if we need to do it that way and the, um, and the patient and the family really uh, really want to um, ha have the PAP screening, as Dr. Smith said, it really is recommended, um, then we, I refer to my gynecology colleagues who have access to the OR and they can do it that way. Um, they're always happy to do that. Um, the risk benefit um, uh, sort of decision making becomes a little bit harder in that case because you really do have to factor in the risk of um, sedation and possible complications of that, especially if it's a patient that already has underlying maybe respiratory problems and the risk of respiratory depression or, or um, aspiration might be a little bit higher um, in those patients. So I think I try to talk them through that part as well. Um, I, but I, I don't personally do sedation in the office. Dr. Smith, do you? I, I don't do sedation either. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I totally, I, yeah, I, agree with that completely. Um, sedation is available, but we refer to colleagues to do that in, in gynecology, and we do talk about risk versus benefit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one final question um, regarding the transition clinic. Um, is the clinic covered by insurance? Yes. As far as I know, I've been billing people's insurance, and I have not heard anything <laughs> Um, I've not been told that anything's gone awry with that. I don't know, Rhonda or Amanda, if you've heard, but it's, as far as I know, it's been covered by people's insurance. Yeah, so it's my understanding, um, and I'm not a billing expert, um, but that the um, office visit is essentially built just like another um, mm -hmm. physician visit. And then Amanda and myself, who also support that clinic, um, our time in visiting with families is covered by a grant. So um, that's how that's taken care of. So really, it's just like um, a, a going to any other doctor's visit. So, um, you know, kind of with the same parameters, I'm sure, as far as like if you're in network and that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was it for questions. Okay. One thing 
that I thought might be helpful is just to kind of discuss a little bit um, what it's actually like in the transition clinic. So what like a family could expect if that's something that they might be interested in. And so I thought I would just take a minute and unless anybody else wants to, to take that or go for it. Okay. Um, so when you make an appointment for the transition clinic, you're going to call and talk to Amanda. Um, she's going to get sent out some information to you about um, some questionnaires to be done ahead of time. And that's really helpful and useful information because when that comes back to us, then it allows Dr. Smith to have a chance to look through that or Dr. Parker um, to look through that and kind of figure out where everybody's at. So there's those two surveys like we talked about earlier. And one is that um, the young adult gets to fill out and then the caregiver. And so there's a chance to kind of look through that to see if there's any maybe where uh, there isn't agreement on some of those things and to kind of talk through those then when you guys um, come in for that appointment. Um, it's an hour long. Again, we've kind of already talked about the billing piece of it. Um, you get a chance to sit down and really get to visit with um, the doc that's covering um, the, the clinic that day um, and really get to know each other, get a chance to um, kind of um, share your story, go through that medical history, and then um, they bring us in, um, and us, I mean, myself and Amanda. I'm a parent resource coordinator, and Amanda is a social worker at uh, MMI. And when I visit with the family, I'm going to be going over lots of things that we've even covered in, like, the transition series, the education series, but we can talk about it specifically for your family. So maybe there's a specific concern you have within that, and then I can help support um, with the information I have or get more information for you if there's something specific within that. Um, frequently, you know, we're talking about like guardianship, education resources, um, maybe it's employment, maybe how do you apply for social security, um, and then I can follow up with you on that as well. But there's also things where you can get more specific, um, like I've had families ask about um, like, is there anything to help with, like, driving skills, like anything special? And, and there are, there are resources for that. Um, also, um, phones, like safety and a simplified smartphone that would be more appropriate for their loved one. So that's kind of where um, we can tailor, you know, we talk about things kind of very broadly throughout this series, but we can really take the time to find out what's most important to your family and um, tailor it to that and to be a support. Um, then Amanda will come in um, and go through kind of those questionnaires again and see really assessing for each family and each individual where they are right now and what are the next steps to help build that self-determination and independence. So, um, and writing a plan for that. So maybe, um, because this is kind of a consultative or, or consult kind of situation, so maybe we'll see you back in six months or a year. And in that time, Amanda would write out the plan that you're gonna, um, the goal is to call um, this physician to make your own appointment or to get your insurance cards together and know where they are and have. So it's kind of just, it's, it's about skill building as well um, and helping build that plan and have those things in place, you know, starting at an early age of 14 through 21. So that way, when they reach that, that end goal, so to speak, of into adulthood, that we've given them lots of tools. Um, so that, that's kind of in a nutshell. I mean, feel free to add anything that I've missed maybe, um, but that's where we can really kind of um, drill down and find out what's most important for your family in particular, your um, young adult, and, and help build that skill set and, and build and set in motion kind of the appropriate things to help get everybody there. Mm -hmm. I agree. And then I can also help with scheduling appointments at MMI because I also am a scheduler with the MMI system in addition to doing social work for the transition clinic. So I can assist with that piece as well. My phone number is just the main MMI scheduling phone number. So if you call that and ask for me, they will get you to me. We can schedule for a transition clinic. I can also do psychology and then get you in touch with our other programs as well. So last call, any other uh, questions, anything else that we can try to answer for you this evening? Okay, well, if not, 
I'm going to go ahead. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening, um, sharing uh, you know, Dr. Smith, Dr. Parker, Annie, Sam, um, for joining us, sharing the information about the wonderful services that you all provide um, and how to help our young adults um, make that next step into adulthood. Um, all of our participants, thank you for um, sticking with us through bad weather and power outages and all that this evening. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put the poll up. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a couple of minutes. Um, oops, sorry, I had, hold on, just one more second. I did have one more question. Um, we did have someone that used, utilized this TRICARE and they just wanted to share this, that they did need to have a referral um, for the clinic. So that's something that's kind of important to know too. So check with your insurance companies um, if that's something that might be needed um, prior to that as well. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, that's a very good point. Um, okay, so I will go ahead and launch the poll. And if you would just take a few minutes to fill that out, it really does help us um, know if we're, we're getting the information out to families that um, is helpful and um, if there's anything that we could do differently to make it even better for you.